The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the demo of some of the keystroke add-ons. Uh, just a couple of things. We'll be covering five add-ons today, and after each one, we will I will go through the questions, so put your questions in. We will not have open mics because we have a lot of material to cover, uh, but I will... Um, do the questions, hopefully at the end we'll have time for some general questions. The other thing, one quick reminder, uh, if you haven't registered for the add-on conference yet, which is September 18th, make sure that you email me and I'll get you registered for that. So with this, I'll pass it over to Ken. Thanks, Vic. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, we are focusing, uh, this webinar is focused strictly on resellers to bring everyone up to speed on uh, what we've been developing recently, what some of our roadmap items are, and, and what our focus is. Uh, we, I sent around an email a couple of months ago basically stating that we will be discontinuing um, any major new SDK products um, in favor of focusing on the API. So for the most part, all the products that you're going to see today are developed in that spirit. So they're all web API products. What does that mean? It means that you know they are going to be able to work directly with um, with hosted databases. Whether whatever our feelings are on Act for Web or the the quality of the product, it is the the fastest growing um, part of the Act market. And you know we want to make sure that you know our development resources and priorities are aligned with that. Um, the the other thing is we know that that Swift Page is going to be very very slow to support add-ons in general um, on their their hosted environment. Um, so we want to make sure that um, you know that we can control our own fate. The um, the other thing is quite frankly they are responding to a lot of our. Uh, our bug reports and feature requests very, very quickly. We often get responses in a day or so, sometimes the same day, and we'll have something fixed by the end of the week. Uh, that's as opposed to the SDK, which is um, you know months and months and months, and sometimes results in no change at all. So writing's on the wall. Uh, all of our development efforts are uh, towards the web API, and this has actually allowed us to, to be quite creative in terms of the services that we offer. So on that note, let's start off with the first one, uh, which is up on the screen, and that's Book to Act. Uh, what you're looking at right now is booktoact.com, which you can certainly go through um, visit afterwards. Um, but the, the name of this, this service is pretty much exactly what the name suggests. You will be able to share your calendar and people will be able to um, look at your calendar and you can, you can surface that link in any way through any of your digital assets, uh, whether it's on social media, your website, your email signature, and people can click on that, see your availability and select a meeting. Okay, and that meeting will immediately go into your calendar, and it, it creates an uh, like a a very simple uh, workflow that will um, allow both people to have that meeting scheduled instantly. So let's take a look at how that looks. So you can certainly go through all of this material. Let's quickly go through. Um, you know, I've broken it down in fairly simple terms. The biggest thing here uh, under system requirements, uh, you need an Act current. You know, current Act subscription. This is working with the Web API, so this will not work with people using Act Pro. It won't work with anyone using uh, perpetual versions of Premium. Um, it will. So you've got that Act Premium Cloud with a Web API URL or a locally installed Act Connect link. So you can. Uh, this can work from either a cloud account or a ground to cloud account. A book to act subscription, and then the latest version of the API. So this last API that you're seeing, which is um, uh, 409 just came out last Thursday. We are waiting on on a new one towards the end of the month that will address one final issue. But for the most part, uh, this program is fully operable, and we've got it in production ourselves for internally. So let's take a look at how um, it in action. So I'm going to click on account login. Immediately go to here. Okay, so this is the, the login screen. So it sees it will display my account settings. Then I go here for the web API. It shows me now this is some auto filled stuff. This isn't accurate. Okay, but this is where you'll put in your web API information, standard web API, uh, web API URL. Your, and if you're using the Act Connect, 
um, it, it, I think you just have to put on, um, it gives you an address and then you have to put on the, the act.web.api at the end of it. And then um, the database name, user act, username, and then password. I'm not going to click on test connection because it's auto inserted invalid information. Okay. Then it comes to the accounts, the calendar settings. Now it's going to take um, about five seconds to load this because it's actually accessing the calendar. So the first part is this is your URL. You copy this, you can embed this uh, wherever you like. This will be your link. Okay. Now the full name here, you want to put like my login for my database is Kenneth Quigley. Um, but you can put in what you want us to be shown on the web. So you can put in Ken Quigley, Kenneth, whichever, uh, whatever name you're comfortable with um, uh, to be surfaced on the book to act site, you can use that. Now, then you've got the primary email address. Now, why do you need the, your particular email address? Well, part of the, the workflow is this, is once a customer books a meeting, it's going to then prompt them to send them an Act for Outlook, sorry, an Act for Act, Outlook, a book to Act or Outlook invitation. And for the Outlook invitation to get attached to the proper contact, it's got to have um, an invitee. Okay, so this information um, goes in as the um, the invitee with the Outlook, and that way they'll be able to attach it to your calendar. Okay, or to their calendar, I should say. So start time, end time, this is where you're setting in your calendar preferences, um, Eastern time zone activity. Now the, the activity type, um, I recommend, I mean, obviously this is not meant to be a tool where people will have you running all over the city. So for, for my purposes, I, I put a call, but you may even want to create a custom activity. Um, but obviously you don't want to make it a meeting or an appointment where, you know, people are dictating where you are um, and such. So we put in a call here and then you can set in your which days you want to be available for. Now, uh, we set this because there will be some people that have uh, meeting days, some people that have production days, uh, whichever. You can set this up very easily to define what your work week is and what you, your work hours are. And then you can allow whether or not someone can book a meeting for the, the current date because you may not want to have um, meetings scheduled that quickly that you're not anticipating. Then there's blacklist days. So I've put in here all the, the blacklist days. And when you add something here, okay, that's, of course, it's not working. Demo wouldn't. So normally you click on add and it would pop up and say um, there is a recurring, uh, you've got a scheduled date and whether or not it's uh, one off or recurring. So here, obviously, July 1st doesn't change because that's Canada Day. That doesn't change um, from year to year. Um, nor does December 25th, 26th, and January 1st. But a lot of other days, um, like for next week, um, my family and I are going away. We've booked these as one-off days. Okay. Then you can set as meeting duration. Um, I like to set 45 minutes and then a 15 minute buffer. Okay. And then we set how far you want to book in advance. Now, I like this idea because I don't want to have people booking uh, a meeting a year from now and suddenly something that isn't even on my radar, I'm now scheduling my vacations around. So, you know, we set uh, how far you can uh, book in the future. Now, alarm enabled, um, this is obviously going to be treated as, um, you know, how it gets reflected in ACT. And then the alarm duration, obviously five minutes in advance. We put in location here for the sake of the Outlook invitation, because sometimes the Outlook invitation will pause before sending if it's missing a field that's expecting. Okay. And then the final two things is what's the, um, thanking them for booking a meeting here, and then your logo as it will appear on the, um, on the appointment page. So let's actually see what that looks like. Now, the first time it takes about five seconds to load based on the um, the speed of the um, the connection. Um, and in this case, you can see here Thursday, um, you can see my availability uh, for today. You can also see my availability for tomorrow. Now, let's book a meeting here. And I'm going to pick on my wife as I normally do. OK, 
Okay, and then six. Okay. Okay. Okay, and we can also set the priority, which will obviously be reflected in ACT. I'll set that as medium, and then I will create the appointment. Okay, now once the appointment is made, then you can say click here. Come on. Okay. And all the details are here. So you'll see in the invitation, you'll see the organizer is Ken at kqc.ca reflecting that email that I put in. Here's the subject, here's the location, here's the, um, the rest of the information and all the details that it pulled from it scheduled via Book to Act. Okay, that's now in there. Now, what you also saw is a notification coming in. This notified me immediately that the, um, the appointment had been made so that I'm even alerted, especially important on with short notice, I get alerted immediately when an appointment is made. And it's all coming from notification at booktoact.com and I've got all the information. So I said, great, I don't have to do anything. Now let's see how that looks in my act calendar. Okay, and let's do it. And now you can see that this um, meeting went in instantly. Okay, that's how, how fast it works with the web API. You get instant um, insertion into the calendar and then you can see the workflow uh, with Outlook and everything else after that. Now, one of the other reasons that we implemented the, the uh, Outlook integration here with the invitation is that they will get an invitation and if for any reason they're not able to make it and they cancel it, then you will be notified back from them, okay, via the Outlook invitation that they're canceling the meeting. So it creates a nice uh, workflow there. Now, um, the last thing I wanted to go back to is the account management. So what's nice about this from a reseller standpoint is that you can actually add a you know an endless list of customers they can get it you can set them up for for trials okay and you can add them up all here and then you can get at the the end of the month um as your your we, we don't have like a reseller margin that's not the way that this is this is built but you can assign subscriptions to them and then at the end of every month uh you will get a commission check Okay, so that's how uh, you can manage it. Otherwise, it's on a referral and we'll need to, to know um, any customers that are tagged to you. Okay, but you know, and it's very, very easy to create it. And uh, by the way, I buried the lead here. Yes, it's $60 per year. Okay, which I think if you uh, compare it to Calendly or a pointlet or any of the other similar services, it's well below any of those. Most of those guys start uh, between um, eight, nine, twelve dollars uh, per user per month. We're at five. Okay. Plus, we're the only one that that writes directly to Act. That doesn't have to go through a Zap or anything else like that, creating additional latency. So then you can just click on here, and it takes you through the uh, the purchase workflow. Okay. So I'm going to encourage everyone to kind of go through. The, uh, the book to act com. Okay. Create a trial account. The trial account is for two weeks. And then once you're, um, once that expires, then you can immediately use uh, within the trial experience. And this is how we're going to be building more and more of our programs, online services within the trial experience, you can complete the transaction. Okay, so it's not going out to uh, third party shopping carts or anything like that. Um, if you are showing anyone uh, this and you want to share with them screen uh, uh, screenshots, then we've got all of these here. Okay, now you can see our logo up here. Obviously, um, you saw within our settings the ability to um, set a logo. So 
they will see whatever logo that particular end user uploads. Okay. And here's all the settings. So very easy to kind of review with people. Okay. And then all the features are uh, broken down here with use cases. And at the very bottom, we've got some standard frequently asked questions. Okay. So we're at the 15 minute point. Let me pause and let's see if there's any questions. So can you block out a time slots on days of choice? And I, yes. think, I think, can you show that you could block out specific days? Yep. And the yeah, other and we are gonna we're, we're gonna be building in the uh, the ability to support date ranges as well. So if you want to say book from June fifteenth through to the June thirtieth and book that off, then you'll be able to do that. And the other part of the question is a yes as well. So, or can you block out unavailable by scheduling something for that time and act? Yes, that works as well. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's you either blacklist it from the um, from the website or blacklist it from the act side. Either one will have equal effect. And another question is from Peter, can we translate the screens in terms of- uh, Translate the screens, yes, I believe, um, I believe it is uh, subject to either the, um, the Chrome translation, um, but that is in our phase two, where um, I think we've already submitted all the strings to, uh, for Ouija to translate, um, so I don't know the exact timetable of that. So um, I think Peter's asking into uh, another language. So uh, Peter, I can uh, go offline with this uh, with you and we can talk about translation strings for- Oh, Peter Pennings? Yes. Oh, okay, terrific. Hey, Pete. Yep, so Peter- Okay, oh, there I, th I, think, I think he has like 65 languages in that small country of his, so I understand the question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so that's it for the questions. So Ken, uh, thank you and- Okay. So let's go to the next one. Okay, so the next one is Web Planner. Now we launched Web Planner last year, and this was a fairly ambitious undertaking because it had previously been written in Silverlight before we bought it. This was not something that we built from scratch. So uh, we bought it in Silverlight and we spent the better part of a year um, bringing, uh, updating it to HTML5 so it can work on all platforms because obviously Silverlight was deprecated uh, about five years ago um, and wasn't supported by anything more than say, I think uh, Safari and Firefox. And I had obviously no uh, mobile support either so you couldn't use it in a tablet. So we spent most of the year re uh, rewriting it and then adding features to it. Um, and then in October, we went through a phase where we had to consolidate all the servers because again, we didn't develop this. So we had um, hosting servers spread you know, all over North America and we um, brought them all together under one roof, which uh, made it much easier to manage and the response time was like 10 times faster. So uh, was really, really a, a nice overnight uh, shot in the arm in terms of performance. But the other thing that we did then at that point, it's like once we got it to market, it's like, well, okay, now we've got to build in the features so uh, that we really wanted, not just be able to convert it from you know Silverlight over to uh, HTML5, but really add the features that we think our customers will want and that we will use ourselves in production. So that's what we did. And I'm going to show you, uh, give you a general walkthrough of how we use it internally. But the website is webplanner.com. These are a sliding carousel of all the different features. You can kind of go through here. We've got a, um, you know, a quick little um, light box video for you guys to watch. And then you can go through all the different features here. Uh, but the big thing, uh, most of the, the new features you can see right in action. So we click on login, and again, much like a book to act, the experience all starts from the trial. So you log in, you create a two-week trial, and then you enable licensing um, from within the trial experience. So you're not going out buying um, a token or a license key and then plugging it in. It's fully enabled, and that was one other thing we, we did um, since last October. So let's go to login. Okay. So here is my 
production dashboard. As you can see, we typically have a lot of projects going on at the time. And what this will do is this will give me a high level view of everything that we've got going on. So I can see things that um, I can see all this is my a timeline. And what this will do is it will show me all of my appointments. Okay, as they're coming up, but it's actually reading across all of my projects. Okay, not just any one of them. Okay, and then here is all of my projects. So here's my timeline, here's all my projects, and I can drill into any one of them. So the first one I'm gonna drill into, which is probably the busiest, is the development board. So I'm gonna click into this. Okay, and by the way, back to the dashboard, when you first log in, obviously you're not gonna have any information like this, and uh, you're gonna have basically an empty screen. New users will be welcome to training videos, here and you can click on here for additional ones okay so you'll immediately get the training resources there and so let's go back into as you can see the login speed is very fast um you know pretty much pops as you click on it and you know this is giving you a breakdown showing you all the overdues approachings on times completed and in, in a very very easy um easy chart here and again showing you a timeline that is now um you know, project specific. So again, here is uh, an, another form of timeline showing everything that has happened, not just approaching tasks, okay, as well as all the team members. So I wanna go directly to my task list, okay? Now the task list, this is, as you can see, uh, we've got Act for Outlook Web, we've got Licensing Service Book to Act, um, we've got all these different projects that we've, uh, I'm able to keep track of, okay? And they're all in one place and I can manage them very, very easily based on status. I can filter them, add uh, tasks to them, do whatever. It's very, very easy for me to manage. So for instance, Act for Outlook um, Web, I left quite a few of these incomplete um, so that you can see how easy it is. So one of the things we wanted it, we wanted to be able to drill into this so that you can set specific progresses here. So percentage done, whichever, you can set predecessors. So if something was reliant on another item being done, then you can set that dependency. So that, um, and the way that would work is, let's say that you wanted to move a, a, a dependent task uh, up ahead a week, then any uh, tasks that were reliant on that would also be moved forward in lockstep by the same period, okay? And then assignments, this is showing everyone that's involved in it, as well as any task, uh, any attachments. So in this case, I can see that I can update the priority, I can uh, change the status, um, you know, in progress, I can input any costs associated with this, and I can change the start and the end date, okay? Um, but basically what I wanna do is do it a lot simpler because often, I'm just, it's a, it's a binary thing. It's not a matter of, of tracking it as a percentage of complete. It's a matter of, I wanna uh, just indicate it's complete. So much like ACT, we created a complete task. So the moment that you click on the completed task, it will uh, mark it as complete, 100% done. And then it's done, okay? Now, what I wanna show you here though, is that let's say that I've got one phase here and I've got a bunch of subtasks and I've been a little lazy on updating each one of the tasks. So I just want to finish a task and have it capture uh, and, you know, basically propagate down the completed status. I can just go to the phase and say here, complete. Now I'm going to click on save. And you'll see here, if this task is marked as complete, all subtasks will be completed. Are you sure you want to continue? And now it's done, okay? And it disappears from screen. Why did it disappear from screen? Because we have, um, much like an act, we learn a lot from this, um, we've got the ability to filter out all the items that are uh, completed so that we can have as clean a workspace as possible. So my default is always that it is completed. Now, let's say that I'm reviewing this and I wanna just say, uh, show me all the items that are on hold. Okay, it automatically filters it. And let's say I wanna go, I also wanna do the in progress 
and then I want to say start it. So you've got the ability to have multiple uh, filters at once. So what where that would be useful is if you wanted to say, show me all the ones that are, I don't want to see the, the on hold ones. And I just want to see all of the active ones. Okay, so all the ones that are either not started, not abandoned, or not complete. Okay, so now I've got the ability to filter out all those ones. So I'm not looking at ones that are on hold that I really don't care about. Okay, and if that satisfies my curiosity, I can just immediately click it there. I can also select uh, single select or multi select by priority. Now, let's say that it doesn't necessarily make sense for me to have this implement licensing at the top. I can actually drag this down and put it over here, okay? And you'll see here, it um, I dropped it in the wrong place, so it, it thinks it's nested under translation. So now I can just go boom and outdent it, okay? And now I've, I've dropped it down, okay? so. Um, very, very easy to move things around. Um, if you just want to move things one item at a time, then you can do that and just complete, uh, keep moving down. But we implemented the, um, the drag and drop in the desktop mode um, just so that people can easily move things around because they may want to import in a spreadsheet a long list of tasks and then move them around based on on uh, chronology or some other or priority whichever okay um, now what we've had to do is disable that feature within mobile because what would happen is if you tried to drag and drop things uh, if you tried to scroll i should say uh, with mobile um, right here you can see i don't actually have to touch the screen i can use the scroll bar on the mouse or i can use the elevator bar here but on a touch screen um, I would frequently, I would touch something to scroll and I would send a, a task flying. So that, that particular drag and drop is disabled in, in the mobile platform, okay? Um, but if I want to just create a new project here within this, I just simply say phase, okay? And I'm gonna call this test project. I don't need to set the, I could set the start date, but I don't need to set the end dates because the end dates will adjust based on the, the tasks that are within the phase. Okay, so now I go down, this is selected, and now I wanna enter in a task. And I'm gonna say, test task. Okay. And now you can immediately see that this phase is projected out to the uh, the 28th to reflect the, the nested tasks. And this all enables us to really build a very, very easy to manage checklist of everything that we've got going on, okay? And then if we want to get really traditional with our, um, our Gantt charts, then we've got the same kind of ability here, okay? We can scroll up and down, move things around, you know, um, standard, you know, just drag and drop here. And then what we also can do is we can literally see a timeline of tasks here. So we can say write a, a comment and we can just type that in normally. And then if we wanna drill into here, okay, that's on that one. Okay, comments. So let me go back to the task list. That's what I meant to write. So I'm gonna say write a comment here, okay? I can write in, okay? So just to update people, okay? And now I see that I've got this. I click on here and I can read this and now I can say either edit, okay? Delete the comment, whichever, okay? So very, very easy to manage, keep track of everything. This is actually what we use to keep track of a lot of the projects that we've got going on. The, um, the production guys, the developers and the project managers, uh, they'll use uh, different applications. But for me, as you know, the person that's got to keep track of, of everything at a very high level, I like to be able to monitor the progress of all these projects at once and set priorities accordingly, okay? 
Um, with that, you also have attachments. You've got reports. Okay. And let's go back to Web Planner. Okay. And let's go through one of the super nice things about this. Okay. First of all, let's take a look at the price. Okay. Web Planner, the, the basic level, and if you want, you can click here and see the, the details behind here. But the basic plan starts at uh, just under five bucks. The professional plan, the most popular one, is under 10 bucks. And the premium plan is just under 15 bucks. So 60 bucks, 120 and 180 approximately per year. Okay. So how does this work and what, what is included? Now, if you've got, and I'm not, not going to go through all of these different things, but if you go through, you can read all the different features. But basically, um, this is to basically work by yourself. Okay, so if you want to develop things, don't have a whole lot of collaborators or any collaborators, uh, you can build one project at a time. And then uh, as each one is completed, then move on to the next one. The professional allows you to have multiple projects at a time um, and have up to five concurrent uh, collaborators. And I'll explain what a collaborator is later. Okay. And then the premium package allows you to have unlimited projects, unlimited collaborators, multi-project task lists, one gigabyte of storage, uh, uh, document uploads, dynamic. You'll also get email notifications. So if you've got upcoming uh, tasks that have been assigned to you and the deadline's coming up, then you will get notified of that. Okay. There's no email notifications on the professional level, but you get up to 10 projects and up to five collaborators. Okay. Now, how would a project work? So let's say I'm going to go back here. And I am going to say, sign a team member. And I want to, I've just imported in, I'm going to say Vic here, add. And now I'm going to say, send an invite. Okay. So Vic is being sent out an invitation. Please join me in my project. Okay, now Vic does not have to have a paid account. All he's got to do is, let's say um, Vic gets this, he sets up a trial account, and then he gets a trial account for two weeks, okay? If he chooses in that way, during that week, those two weeks, he's able to participate at a, with a basic account, which means he can create projects, so on and so forth. But once those two weeks expire, if he does not want to pay for an account, he's under no obligation to, his account will automatically transition into a collaborator, which means he can't create any projects, but he can participate and update, um, add in comments, complete tasks, update tasks, things like that. So you can have as, as many free collaborators as your account supports obviously five for professional and an unlimited for premium. So this gets really, really handy where you can have, uh, let's say you've got the premium package, you can send out 20 email notifications inviting people to participate. Um, you, they don't need to install anything, they don't need to pay anything. And the moment that they participate in, they're able to have like that one login spot where they can update everyone as to their progress. So very, very easy to bring people into a project, whether or not you're planning a wedding, you're planning a software deployment, uh, renovations, or just a simple party, whichever. It's very easy to put together a quick uh, project and uh, loop people in. And in fact, we go back here and you click on wizard. The wizard will even walk you through, we'll just say, okay, Wedding plan, okay, and it will give you, actually, I'm going to go out of here. It's going to give you all kinds of different tasks here, but let me go back to this. Okay, go back to this, and then I'm going to create a new project here. Now, what you can do is click on project templates. And you've got all of these uh, templates that you can work with. So uh, set up office of project management templates, uh, scientific uh, product, um, 
you know, company newsletter, infrastructure rollout, create a winning presentation, blah, blah, blah. You guys can read all of this. Um, and you can also add templates here. So one of the things that, that, you know, we want to do is basically set up a template for people planning a wedding. So you can just simply add a template, enter in the subject. Okay. And it can pull in as a guide, um, any existing uh, projects that you've got. But let's go back to the beginning, click on new. A wedding plan. Okay, and then it brings me through my wizard. Okay, and I can click on phases. Okay, and as you type things in, you're going to see little prompts. Okay, based on on. The, the fairly long library of tasks. And you just basically go through all of these different steps and it walks you through how, um, the, you know, just set up the phases. And then as you get to the phases, set up the goals. Um, you can pull in things that are similar. Okay, similar projects. Okay, so, and pull in all the stages and then move over um, phases or tasks that make sense. Okay, and then you set your team members. And you know, just click on here. You can either pull from your contact list, which is up here, okay, or enter them in manually, okay. And then it's important to set obstacles, and then set in assigns. Now, obviously, we don't have any tasks, but this is where you would have your long list of tasks or phases, and you can assign people to it, okay. So very straightforward, the account management, uh, similar to the book to act, where you know, now you can see all the active subscriptions. And what's really nice is, let's say that you've purchased several subscriptions for someone, uh, for people within your, um, your company, and one person leaves or is going on mad leave, and you wanna transfer the account over to someone else. So you can literally unassign people, and then assign uh, licenses uh, to someone else, okay? So, you know, buy new subscriptions here, invite new users, whichever. It's all very, very simple. It's all within um, either the trial experience or within the subscription experience, okay? And again, one of the big things that if you're uh, trying to socialize information on Web Planner, if you look around and you look at all the different uh, competitive services, um, one, you'll not only find them more expensive on a per user basis, because when you look at $5 uh, per month, you know, $10 per month and $15 per month, you'll find that most services start at around this. But when you actually drill in and try to, to book anything, you'll find that almost all of them have a minimum five users. So, you know, instead of of being expensive just on a per user basis, suddenly you know you're looking at a fifteen dollar um, purchase that can end up being ninety dollars, okay, ninety dollars per month, and then always build annually. So what started off as one hundred and eighty, okay, now you're looking at over a thousand, and that's a massive uh, price difference. So just keep in mind that one of the biggest benefits of Web Planner is that there is no user minimums. You can start off with one user account, a one paid user account and stick with that. So you don't have to you know, try to get a bunch of people together and cost justify it because you can uh, step in at as little as $60 per year. Okay, um, so I am at uh, 240, so I will pause and see if there's any questions. No, there's no questions at this time. Okay, the one other thing that I wanted to, uh, to demonstrate is that if you go to contacts, you've got the ability to uh, add a normal contact just by manually typing them in, importing them from, um, from Outlook, importing them from Act um, using the SDK, or importing from Act for Web using the API. So that's another reason that we are incorporating this in today. Okay, so and again, these will be uh, supported by uh, reseller commissions. So please feel free to socialize this as much as you can. But I, I honestly believe that project management really works hand in glove uh, with CRM. 
because CRM, just from a calendar standpoint, works entirely differently based on appointments, slots into calendars, things like that, whereas um, project management typically works in ranges. Okay, so a much more different uh, scheduling system. So um, it's very difficult to use one for both. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go over to the last item that I'm personally covering today, and that is quoting for ACT. Now, quoting for ACT is a product that kind of evolved over the last year. We came out with it, and it was initially uh, tables dependent, so it worked only with either tables for ACT or it worked with um, uh, with ACT Premium Plus. Um, what we realized is that um, the dependencies on tables were actually not that necessary. So what we did is we just added um, five additional or six additional um, custom fields to the uh, the opportunity table and that really relieved that that barrier to entry so you can actually use it directly um, with ACT without any other add-on. Okay, so let's show how it works because uh, the beauty of this is really just how simple it is. So I'm going to go into uh, one of the bigger, uh, not that big of an opportunity. Okay. Okay, so now I've got an opportunity. Um, if this was not an existing opportunity, I wanted to create an opportunity, all I'd have to do is just go through the simple process of creating a new opportunity and entering in products. So the way to build a quote is really as simple as creating an opportunity. So if this weren't an existing one, I was just gonna create a new one. I would just uh, create an opportunity, link it to a contact, and I would add all the products and services under here as I would normally do, and it would obviously populate up here. I would set, the, the one thing I would, I would recommend is set the estimated close date carefully, because that will also be when you generate a quote, a valid to date. Okay, and then you know go through the normal process of assigning it the appropriate process and things like that. But all of this doesn't uh, matter in terms of the quote. Um, so now, uh, when you first set it up, you've got to click on um, quoting for act and then set up um, the importing the fields. Okay, I'm not going to go through that process, but it's fairly straightforward. And now I'm going to, and then you can import in products directly into the product table. Um, that's a fairly straightforward process. Uh, we've simplified that a little bit. So, but here's the opportunity. And I, it's taken me like nothing to pull up an opportunity. Now I want to just generate a quote. And this is what happens. It immediately comes up with this screen. And let's go through some of the settings that I can do here. I can uh, set, you'll notice here, I can have any number of preset settings. So in this case, let's say I want to sell this person beer. I can select this. Um, I find that this is useful. I mean, we, we actually thought of it for our own internal purposes where, you know, we've got, you know, Keystroke as a company. We have the Act Marketplace as another company. We have Handheld Contact as another company. And we wanted the ability to send out a quote with different branding each time. And we actually had that requested by more than a few people where there was department to department um, needs for unique branding. So you can set up as many, um, as many profiles as you like here. Um, so it allows you to you know, immediately pull them over. So you can set your logos, you can set your, um, your, your, um, your title fonts, your background colors, whichever. Um, and then you can set in here your quote prefix. Now the quote prefix is important because if you're working on an RDB, you want to be able to set a prefix because it will track uh, and assign a different quote number based on sequence, right? So it will automatically assign a new sequence. But if you've got two people with RDBs, that have that are starting off with the same number you want to make sure that you know when they sync that they have different uh quote numbers and the best way of doing that is setting in a unique prefix uh prefix so i put in q underscore hundred and that way i know that all my quotes will be different from anyone else i can set up in a suffix as well uh we put in here the the tax number okay um because sometimes when you are sending out an estimate um, it, certainly in Canada, if you're, if you are quoting tax, you have to actually put in the valid tax number. 
Um, then we wanted, to, because for the, you know, just sake of, of um, commercial nicety here, we put in the option to have a footer. So we put in, we take the win out of a win-win relationship, just for giggles. And then for disclaimer, disclaimer information, we promise never to give you your money back. Again, us just being hilarious. So what here you would normally put in your refund policy terms and conditions um things uh statements uh similar to um you know a signed contract forms a, um you know a legally binding contract things like that so you can put in all of these things and then this last thing here is the actual default email content so when you go to email this this pair, this box here will get automatically inserted into your email so you, you don't have to type out you know the same basic text over and over again thanking people for the quoting opportunity and here's your quote okay um so this you can put in to save yourself some time tax settings um we put in here because we actually represent a number of different areas so hst is important for us in ontario qst is important for all of our customers in quebec and gst is what we would charge uh, people outside of those two provinces within canada okay and then we also have the ability to set the default currency Be again we build this around um our needs so we assume that there are a lot of be other people with it so we set the ability to uh, determine the currency that you're uh, quoting in okay and you can add in things i'm not sure what peter's currency is i'm chicken entrails or whatever it is they trade over there in the netherlands um, but you can set in all kinds of different ones here um, and then set defaults okay now what i want sure to add get... uh, just quickly before uh, ken puts himself be before, be before before Peter sends me more damning emails, yes. Um, is that we also in handled contact. Some of you might not be aware of it. If you go to the opportunities, we do, ha do have the ability to quote and send invoices from handled contact as well. And the settings that you're seeing on the screen here, we have similar settings built into handled contact uh, to set up yep. for the quoting. Yeah, this, this tool is actually the inspiration to build it into handheld contact. So a lot of the features we took as a guide as you know the development evolved on this, Okay, but these settings here, once you set them, they will become your default for all the, the future quotes that you make. And then obviously you can change here. So now that I've done that, you can see that this has come over. And let's take a look at some of the options. I can indicate whether tax is in, uh, applied, foreign exchange is applied, or deposit override. You can also indicate over here what your deposit will be. Okay, you may want to actually uh, reduce the deposit. Okay, obviously a deposit of 100% is a little hefty. Okay, and it will calculate everything for you. Okay, and then um, deposit required by, like what's the date that the deposit will be required by. This information was pulled in from app. Okay, um, so was this information. Now you'll notice that the valid two also reflects the, um, the estimated close date. So that's a useful bit of continuity and saves time. Um, you can set in shipping. Okay, um, you can set even foreign exchange. Now, obviously, we haven't applied foreign exchange to anything, so this won't be necessary. Calculates the subtotal. You can even calculate here to apply any additional changes. Um, you can set send email immediately after saving PDF. A uh, quote for internal usage. Now, what this means is that it's also going to share the cost. Obviously, you're not going to share that with an end user, but if you're quoting for internal usage, that when you send it, um, that um, internal colleague will see the cost as well. Uh, show grid lines, it's, it, you know, instead of the, uh, the normal quote, it's gonna put in grid lines everywhere and then include foreign exchange. So I'm gonna actually disable that. So you see foreign exchange uh, clears out and now I'm gonna click to print to PDF. And let's see what this quote looks like. Boom, okay. So now you've got professional looking quote Covering currency, quote numbers, they it's automatically assigned a quote, the valid twos, the quantity, the rate. Okay, and it's included all the, um, the taxes because I actually didn't go to the trouble of filtering out any of the taxes. And it's come up with this and then it's got the deposit amount, the tax number, where they're going to sign, the disclaimer, and then the slogan at the bottom. Okay, it is really, as easy as creating an opportunity. You'll be one click away, okay? What is really nice about the uh, Quoting for Act is that it also works in the web. Now, one caveat with this, because uh, one of the big differences between the SDK 
and uh, the web API is the web API really is designed to work with data. It's not designed to put in buttons like up here. So for that, we actually have to put in a DLL on the, the hosted server um, in the web config folder. So make sure that if you are promising this in a uh, web environment that you have a supported hoster. Right now, SwiftPage does not support third-party add-ons, even though this would be an easy one because you can just drop it in one directory, okay? So, and it's that simple. So you can um, save and close, and any emails that you send from here will be attached to history. That easy, okay? So I'm actually, I've run out of time uh, for my part, so let me uh, see if there's any questions. Yeah, one question. Uh, on quotation email content, can we add in merge fields? Uh, no, there's not. Um, there isn't support for merge fields in this. Right. Any so you can't bring in any any of the other opportunity fields. But the nice thing is, this is a one-time cost of a hundred bucks. Okay, and people can just go to town with it. Okay, and they can quote and quote and quote. And you know, as we update it, then they'll be uh, able to receive those updates through the Act for Work updater. But it's nice and simple. We included in this because of its web uh, support. But I just wanted to, you know, stress that it isn't technically a web API tool because it requires a DLL on the hosted server. So for people that are self-hosting and publishing it themselves, obviously there's no issues with them controlling that. Uh, people that have um, supported hosting providers uh, like Keystroke, RTG, I believe Tech Commandos as well, um, then you can negotiate that with them. Okay. Excellent. And that is it. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, now we'll be moving over to Awesome. Awesome is our uh, CTO. Many of you have probably heard his name many times. And he'll be doing Optin Manager for Web as well as Act for Outlook Web. So, Awesome, I'm going to change presenter to you. Okay. And you're on. Okay, let me know if you can see my screen there. Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. So, um, I guess first uh, we'll start with Optin Manager. Um, let me start that up. Um, so it's going to be a standalone product. Um, it's not going to require ACT. Uh, it's going to need the uh, Web API uh, URL. So um, once you um, start up, uh, click on the ACT API settings and just type in your um, ACT uh, credentials and the API. Um, you can hit uh, login here to test to make sure everything works. Okay, and uh, once you have that uh, set up, um, you can click on Optin Manager Web um, and go to Settings. Um, and then from here, um, the settings should be pretty similar to the Windows version if you've used that before. Um, so you uh, have to sign up for an account on optinmanagement.com uh, um, and you basically enter your username, password, and the account ID uh, that you get. So if I uh, open that up here uh, on the web page, so once once you um, uh, sign into your account, you just uh, click uh, log in here, and then click uh, Optin Manager Web Page Settings, and that's all the uh, the settings that you'll need. So just click Copy for the ID, uh, paste that in here, um, and uh, also on this page you can set up uh, uh, things like your company name, URL, set up a logo if you want, and a, a little message that your um, end users will see uh, when they uh, get your email. Um, so if we go back over here, um, so it, it, this does require a, a field to be created in ACT, um, so then that, that, that's the uh, contact exclusion field. Um, so you can just quickly create that by clicking the create permission field button. Um, I obviously have that created. Um, so yeah, as you can see, it says the email permission already exists. Do you want to use it? Just say yes, and that should uh, select that. But if you already have, uh, the, uh, or if you rather uh, use another field, you can select that from the dropdown. Um, and also, if we go here, so here's the uh, the value that the um, um, the plugin will uh, ignore. So if any uh, contact has this value here in in the email permission field, uh, those will be ignored. So by default, it's denied, but you can change that. Um, and also at the bottom, um, if if the contact opted in, it will be uh, Set to accepted in ACT, uh, if not denied. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Um, now, this will require um, you to have your own uh, email server. So, if you click on email server settings under SMTP, um, you will have to provide your SMTP credentials. 
Um, so you, you can use um, your own, uh, but for uh, sending a large email blast, we would recommend using a third-party provider like uh, MailJet or SendGrid um, that are not going to um, block your emails for you know, suspected spam if you're sending uh, thousands and thousands of emails. Okay, um, and if you go into history, uh, you can select the history type that you want. Um, email sent is the default, but uh, I would recommend creating a custom um, activity, to, uh, sorry, a history type so you can uh, quickly filter those uh, for reporting purposes. Um, and finally, something new we added uh, is the Bright Verify integration. Um, so before uh, you even really send out the emails, you probably would want to uh, verify that the email address <laughs> excuse me, email addresses you have in ACT um, are correct. Um, and Bride Verify is a third party service that can do that. Um, so if I open up uh, the account here, um, and you, you simply sign up for the account, um, enter in your credit card number, and that's really it. Uh, they would give you an API key that you can uh, go over and uh, fill in over here. Um, and for every query, um, it, it will, I, I believe, uh, it starts at about one cent per email check. Uh, and the more you test, I think uh, they'll give you volume discounts. So, um, so you would go into the account under API keys. If you scroll down, um, there's the backend API key that uh, you'll need. Um, so I obviously changed ours, but uh, you can just uh, right click, copy, and then paste it uh, over here. So you want to keep this secure because this is tied to your um, credit card. So uh, you know any checks that are made using this key will um, add uh, cost to uh, your credit card. So you want to keep that secure. Um, okay, so once that's done, uh, you can save that. Um, click on Optin Manager Web again, um, and under Email Blast, um, click on Edit Email Template. <clears throat> so that's uh, what uh, your contact will see when you send them the uh, the permission uh, email. Um, so you can uh, include custom fields from your uh, contact table if you want. Uh, just include them in a uh, uh, angled bracket. Um, and you can type in a message. Um, we, we would uh, recommend you keep it fairly short. Um, so obviously no images and anything are allowed just so that um, there's a very low chance that the emails will get blocked by uh, uh, you know, spam filters or anything like that because we want to maximize deliverability um, for this uh, purpose. So uh, again, you want to keep it pretty sh uh, short and sweet. Um, so at the bottom there, if you click preview, uh, they'll give you a little preview of what the email will look like. So there's the link that they can click to accept or deny. And obviously you can change the, uh, the text at the top here, uh, give it a subject and also your uh, signature. Okay, so once you have that set up, um, I'll first go through the, um, the email blast and then we'll uh, go back to the uh, Bright Verify. Um, just keep it in uh, order. Um, so click on um, Option Manager Web and send uh, email blast and send emails. Um, so it's going to be in a wizard uh, format, um, and at the very t uh, f um, the first page, uh, you'll have a few options. So you can either select specific contacts that you want in your email blast, um, or you can just quickly uh, select contacts that have uh, nothing in their uh, email permission field. So uh, this way, you don't have to manually select them. Um, uh, or you can, uh, if you already have a group set up, you can uh, click that and then select the uh, group from ACT. Um, or uh, you can select all contacts, but you probably want to, at least for testing, uh, you want to select some uh, manually. Uh, so I'll do that and hit next. Um, I believe I already have some set up here. So, um, oh, and um, uh, this will give you, um, on this page, you'll, you'll see a full um, list of your contacts. Uh, it is going to be limited to 25 records per page. So you can hit the next and previous bu uh, page buttons to go through those. Uh, or you can just enter in uh, some text at the top and hit enter, and that will filter on um, uh, the email um, uh, company and uh, contact field. I'm not sure why it's uh, not pulling that up. Let me just refresh the connection. Sometimes that can get timed out. Let me try that again. Yep, so I do it again. Yep, there we go. Um, so um, you just uh, type in the name and that will uh, search through the, uh, you can see the contact, but it also search the email fields here and, and include those records. So I'll just hit this uh, right arrow here to add those three. Um, hit next. Um, and this is just a confirmation screen letting you know you're about to send emails to three records. Um, hit next. Um, and it's going to go through um, and also uh, create histories for those records. 
Um, so if I go over here and uh, we'll just go on admin history, you can see, um, I believe this is, oh, because I already tested, let me delete that. Um, uh, yep, yeah, so this is what the history would look like. So the, uh, um, the contact permission email was sent. Uh, it has the contact ID, the email, and the date that it was sent on. Um, so if I actually go over into Outlook, uh, I'll pull up here. So this is what the email uh, looks like. Um, again, pretty uh, simple. Um, just, uh, the user will uh, click on the link here and it will take them to the optinmanagement.com website. Um, and here are the, uh, the buttons that they can uh, click. So I'll just uh, hit opt-in and it just says thank you for submitting. You, you may close the window. Um, and it should be that simple for the contact. So uh, pretty straightforward. Um, so once that's done, um, I would say uh, maybe once a week or so, I would recommend uh, up, uh, updating your database uh, because once uh, the contact list, the link in the email, uh, the results will be saved in, uh, uh, on, the, on the database on the web server, um, but we will not store any uh, information like uh, email address or uh, IP address or anything like that. The only thing that will be stored is um, this ID here. So this is what we use to kind of match uh, the results back to your database. Um, so once you hit uh, opt-in manager web and update contacts, um, it will actually go through and download uh, those re uh, results. You can see uh, it uh, shows you that one contact was updated and total opt-ins was one and zero opt-outs. Um, so if I go here and hit refresh, um, yeah, again, that, that's probably uh, one of the, <laughs> uh, um, the curses of the demo, uh, I didn't create the history record, but normally it would create a history record here, uh, indicating that the uh, contact had uh, opted in. Um, and uh, that's it for uh, getting the uh, opt-in and opt-outs. Uh, the other thing was uh, that I mentioned was the Bright Verify um, integration. So once you have that, um, uh, the uh, Bright Verify integration section filled in, um, you would uh, click on Opt-in Manager Web, email list verification, and verify using Bright Verify. Um, the the uh, UI is going to be pretty similar um, to uh, what we see, uh, saw before. Um, I'll again select selected uh, contacts and I will select uh, one of my records here. Um, or I select the admin, I believe. Yep. And then I have another invalid contact with uh, an invalid email. So I'll select that. So there's uh, one contact with a valid email and one with an invalid email. So we can see what it looks like. Um, so I will then hit next uh, to confirm that it will be sent to two records, hit next again, and it has verified those. So if I go back here, uh, you can see under email address status, um, uh, the uh, value set to valid. And if I go on to the invalid person here, uh, the email address status is set to invalid. So this, this way you can quickly kind of filter out uh, bad email addresses um, and then either you know call them directly and get up-to-date information or just remove them from the database. Um, and if you go on to the Bright Verify website, uh, there's a, a excla explanation of what the uh, the different statuses mean. Um, so the first two are pretty uh, simple. Uh, this is um, these two are used when the the service knows exactly you know if it's valid or invalid. Um, the last two, unknown and accept all, is when it's not sure. So unknown could be um, a network issue or maybe the the web ser uh, sorry the email server didn't respond in time. That could be set to unknown. So for those, you might want to run it again after a while. Um, and accept all is when they have per um, the domain has um, like a general, general uh, delivery inbox, so which kind of accepts everything. So even even you know if, if they don't necessarily have an email account with you know info at domain.com, it would still get accepted for delivery. So in that case, we can't really verify it. So in, um, for those, uh, it would be set to accept all. Uh, but again, all this info is on their website if you want to read uh, more uh, about that. Um, but uh, I believe that is it. Uh, do you have any questions? Okay, there's no questions there, but I have a couple. Um, one is a statement. Yep. So this is very important for those of you that attended Andy Wood's webinar as well on Monday. A key for the growth suite in terms of the AMA. So make sure you're on top of this. Uh, the other question I have is, can you just review the pricing, either Ken or um, Awesome? 
Yes. So the the pricing is two hundred dollars per year. Okay, for the opt in manager. Um, you and it's for one or the other. You don't. If you get one subscription for the web version, you don't automatically get entitlement for the Windows version. So be sure to select uh, which deployment type works for you the best. Um, and I just want to echo what Vic said. Um, we really, I mean, we've been using this for years. So this was initially inspired, um, and the initial iteration was called Act for Castle when the Canadian anti-spam legislation was introduced in 2014. And then as GDPR came forward. And you know additional um, you know spam and privacy legislations uh, kicked in. You know we we rebranded this as the opt-in manager. Um, at Swift Pages' request, we built in the uh, the Bright Verify uh, integration so that you can really have two stages of scrubbing: one to you know verify the validity of an email address, and then the next one to harvest this. So just to kind of give you a sense of how quick this works, you can send out thousands and thousands of emails and um, basically download updates in the thousands within minutes. Okay, so just imagine how many times, how long it would take if you were responding to email permissions, people sending you back, yep, email me, whichever, um, it would take forever and it still wouldn't have the same auditing that our services does. So between the two, uh, stages of email verification um, and uh, harvesting the opt-ins, you can produce a really good um, uh, scrubbing, a list scrubbing. And more importantly, as resellers, you get recurring revenue on this because it's $200 per year, but you're also providing a service because a lot of the end users will never have heard of this. There isn't a, you know, a, a, a monthly newsletter that goes out to all ACT users telling them you know, what add-ons to buy. So you can really be you know, a, a, an important gateway to informing people on the efficient tools to use for this. And for all the tools, Ken, can they pull information off our website? Yeah, so they can go, you can go to, if you, if you want, um, you know, and we fully respect that people aren't going to want to shepherd um, their customers uh, to uh, keystroke.ca, which is why we have, you know, webplanner.com, uh, booktoact.com, uh, those kind of dedicated sites. But if we don't have a dedicated site, because we're obviously, we can't build a dedicated site for every single product. But if you want to use, um, if you want to send people to a site, then go to actaddonshop.com. Okay, and you'll be able to go there and, you know, obviously a white labeled site and they can learn more about it there. Okay. Excellent. Thank and you. if it's any, if, it, if it's any of our keystroke products, uh, we don't, have, we, we, we cannot, um, you know, through the, the shopping cart for, for other ones, because let's say it's another developer, we can't, um, you know, provide a, a commission through that because there just isn't enough margin. But if your customer decides that, you know, they learn about it and they like it through the act add on shop and they want to, uh, and do you want to buy it through keystroke, then you would be reseller protected through keystroke, but anything that's purchased, um, from an end user or from a reseller on act add on shop, um, there is no reseller margin. So just keep, please keep that in mind in terms of your selling strategy. Again, and if you have any questions about the reseller program, again, you can give me a call as well. All right, yeah. with that, I'd like to, uh, awesome, if you can look at Act for Outlook Web now. Thank you. Yep, so I believe I closed Outlook there. Let me restart it back up. Okay, so um, I'm assuming most of you are probably familiar uh, with Act for Outlook. Uh, um, but and uh, the Afro Outlook Web is uh, pretty much identical in terms of functionality. Uh, the only thing is it uh, will now use the uh, Act Web API uh, instead of the SDK. Um, so that's one of the, uh, the new things is uh, you would come in here in the settings and then enter uh, the URL. Uh, you can also provide the APFW URL. Um, this is going to be mostly needed just for the go to contact function. Um, but uh, it's not needed for uh, any of the other um, functionality. So if you're on, um, you know, let's say RTG and uh, you need a, an ultimate hosting plan for to support plugins, then in that case you don't need it just for the go to contact. You can leave that blank uh, and just use the uh, local uh, the uh, API URL, and that will cover your uh, history recording, creating of activities, and so on. Okay. So um, once you have that filled in uh, on the Second screen here is the history recording settings. So uh, again, some of the standard um, settings such as uh, subject body attachments. Uh, we have a few one, uh, new ones such as subject and attachments and uh, attach um, 
when in, there is an attachment. Um, you can pick those. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, some of the standard ones like attach emails to ACK users. Uh, you can make the history private. Uh, one of the new ones is the attach all sent emails, even if they're not sent from the machine. So if you enable that and uh, uh, an Outlook is running on the machine um, and you're using um, uh, an account type that synchronizes the sent uh, folder in your inbox, so uh, Exchange or IMAP uh, and so on, um, and if you send an email from your mobile, let's say, um, then uh, since the sent folder is synchronized, um, the Outlook running on your desktop will be able to pick up that message and attach it to ACT. Um, so it's a pretty uh, handy feature there. Um, and also for history linking, you can link the emails to the company that the contact is associated with and also any, opportun uh, any open opportunities automatically. Um, and of course, if there's any email accounts that you don't want emails to be attached from, um, you can select those uh, if you want here. Um, and incoming messages, um, you can enable that checkbox and it will um, record any incoming messages. Um, if you don't want messages recorded from um, any specific domain, such as gmail.com or something like that, uh, you can click add and add those or any, uh, um, for example, uh, you can enter your internal company's um, uh, domain name and uh, any uh, messages that come in from that address will be uh, ignored. Okay, um, so once you save that, um, I'll just quickly go through some of the, um, the features. Um, so most of them are probably going to be accessed through the right-click uh, menu. So if you right-click, um, you can uh, click go to uh, contact. Um, so this, this function will need that uh, APFW URL that I uh, mentioned. Um, so I'll quickly show you that. Um, so since I was already logged in, uh, you can see it, it picked up my, um, uh, my uh, session, the, the Act for Web session, and just opened a new tab. Uh, and there's the lookup of the, uh, the contacts that matched my email. Um, so it works similar to the desktop version. Um, it can find one or multiple records and we'll show you the, the detail viewer list view uh, depending on the number of results. Um, and if I pick another one, uh, you can see it's saying that it's not able to find a contact. So um, again, it's pretty simple. And uh, this, uh, the APFW URL is the, that's the only place that it will be used. So it's not necessary for anything else that we're gonna uh, cover next. Okay, so the next one here is quick attach. Um, pretty uh, simple as well, you just right click one or multiple messages uh, and then right click and then click on quick attach emails to act and it will go through and it will uh, attach emails, uh, those emails to act. Uh, and one more thing I uh, forgot to mention, uh, the new version is actually gonna be able to change this little icon here for each email. So every email that gets attached, it will um, change the icon, this little green arrow. So it's a quick way to see uh, that the uh, email has been uh, getting recorded. Um, that's a nice feature. Um, so if you right click here, um, so quick attach, it basically picks the, uh, the sender's um, uh, email address. But if you want to manually attach the email uh, to a specific e uh, contact record uh, or other entities like companies, groups, and uh, opportunities, um, you can use the send email to act function. Um, so when you do that, it should automatically pick up the uh, the contact that matched that email address. Um, and then from there you can, uh, let's say click on a link to groups and then pick a group and then hit okay and then add uh, any more um, uh, entities that you want manually. Hit okay, and then from here you can also select a different history type than the default. Um, hit send and that will send that over to Act. Okay, and the next one is create contact. Um, so um, if you right click uh, and uh, set to, uh, create contact, uh, it, it should automatically pick up if the contact already exists. So in this case, you can see it says that the contact was already found. Do you still want to create a new one? Um, in this case, I'll hit no and I'll pick Ken and click create contact. Um, and it should automatically fill in the contact name and email address. Uh, the rest of the, the fields you can enter in manually or just copy from the email uh, uh, that the uh, contact sent you. Um, and then you can also click on settings and actually see um, all the fields in the database and add those to um, to your uh, list. I'll just add a couple. 
and then these you can um, customize and uh, reorder uh, as you like. Okay, and I'll just hit create here and the contacts created. I should be able to search it e even here in uh, the web database. Yep, so there it is. Um, now the next one is create activity. Um, so um, it, when you click on create uh, activity, it should copy the contents of the email uh, and put them in the details tab uh, by default, and then uh, select the, um, the subject and put that in the regarding field. Uh, and then the rest of the uh, fields you can customize. Uh, you can change the, uh, uh, the activity date, the time, you get timeless, uh, you can set the alarm. Uh, all this stuff should be pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, you can also schedule a meeting in Outlook. So when you click on that, it will actually create a meeting invitation that you can send out um, to the um, to the contact um, and enter a user. And again, you can select it to um, any number of different entities. Um, or in, in some cases, if the uh, contact is not found, uh, what you can do is quickly click on link to my contact and you can see that in my uh, user record, which is admin. Uh, so instead of you know clicking link to contacts and finding your record, you can just quickly click on link to my contact um, and just hit create. Um, and since I said uh, create an invite, it, you can see it created the uh, the meeting invitation that I can now send to the contacts. Okay, um, and then I believe that's it. Um, so if you double click to open up uh, an email, uh, some of the same uh, settings are uh, sorry the options are here on the buttons on top. Um, create activity, create contact. One of the uh, the new things we added for the, uh, especially for the the web version of Act for Outlook is view history because uh, on the uh, the actual web interface, sometimes navigating from contact to contact and then opening history uh, tab can be a little bit slow. As you can see, it kind of takes a while and then it, it can only get slower uh, once more uh, history records are there. So you can quickly just, uh, once you're on a contact, you can click view history and it should pull up the history list and then you can quickly scan the, um, the history details from there. Okay, um, and when you're in the compose view, uh, if you click on new email, um, there are a couple of buttons. Um, so one is send and link. Um, so when you're um, about to send an email, uh, if you just hit the nor uh, use the normal send button, it will just look at the uh, the recipients. So the under the two and uh, any other people that you've copied, uh, it will try to find them in Act and attach them. Um, again, and if you want to manually select certain ones, so you can hit send and link. Um, here you can see it already detected certain ones, um, but you can now click you know, link to company and so on, and uh, manually select those records if you like. Um, and if you're sending it to a, an internal user or maybe someone that you don't necessarily want to record the history to, uh, you can click the send without attaching button and it will just send the email but not attach to the um, the contact record. Okay, and I believe some of the, one of the last ones was the um, sending contacts. You can also do that from the, um, from the contact screen in Outlook. If you right click on a contact, you get the option of send contact act. Um, and as you're actually sending them, you can link them to a uh, company if you already know, uh, if you already know uh, that a contact belongs to a certain company. Uh, and the same thing with uh, uh, activities. If I right click here, um, you can select uh, one, or, one or more and then click send activity to act. Um, because uh, most of the information is gonna be pulled from the activity itself, you're not gonna get another prompt. Um, you just click Send Activity to Act, and it will just go through and uh, send that using the the you know the start and end dates and um, all the other information. Um, and I believe uh, oh, and one more thing is the Act database settings on the Home toolbar. If you click on that, um, this is where you will select the the mapping. Um, so when you're sending contacts to Act, um, you can select uh, you know which fields will map to what field in Act. So for example, you know, website, I want to probably map to website. Um, so it's, it's not going to have uh, a lot of fields here because we're trying to maintain backwards compatibility. Um, so these are some of the fields that were present in Outlook 2010. So that's what you can map right now. Uh, I know that in recent versions, uh, Microsoft has added more, but for now, um, this is what's going to be um, 
available. And then you can also enable the duplicate check checkbox here. So right now I'm duplicate checking them based on the email address. Um, <clears throat> so if I click on uh, activity settings, um, that's what the uh, the activity type will be uh, when I right click something from my calendar and send to act. Um, and also if you enable this checkbox here to automatically show the create activity window, um, when you accept meeting invites or just manually add an activity um, in Outlook, uh, it will actually show you uh, the uh, create activity window um, automatically. Um, and uh, similar to how the act native uh, act item does. Uh, and uh, so you can quickly add those to act as well without having to right click uh, them afterwards. Um, and under history settings, this is the uh, incoming uh, history type. So uh, here you can select uh, by default, it's email auto attach, but if you want to create a custom one for incoming emails, you can select that here. Uh, and I believe that's it. Uh, any questions so far? Yeah. yeah. Um, one is, I assume that ACT Outlook integration will need to be disabled for ACT for Outlook to work best. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I believe it's, um, it will need to be, if, especially if you have a, a locally installed version of ACT, uh, it will need to be dis disabled because otherwise it will record duplicates. Um, if you're just using uh, ACT in the web browser uh, and you haven't installed the web integration, then yes, that, that's fine. Okay. The, another question is, can you attach to Opportunity? I think you showed that. Uh, yes, you can. Um, so if I right click send to email to ACT, there's a link to Opportunities button. I don't think I have, yeah, I don't think I have any Opportunities right now in the database, but yes, you can. Yeah, and then also to an incoming email, but I think you showed that as well. Yep. So incoming emails, by default, they're not attached to any um, um, any custom records. They'll just go by what your uh, what the uh, the sender's email address is. But yes, from the inbox, you can manually select uh, you know one or two or uh, more, and then send emails to act, and then link them to whatever uh, that you oh, like. Oh, and an incoming email to opportunity. Uh, by default, it will not attach to opportunity. I don't think. But if you, but if you uh, write, actually, no, go ahead. I don't oh, think okay. it attaches. How, how could it attach it to an incoming opportunity with no email attached to it? And in, yes, in I, incoming I, email to an opportunity. You, you yes, can go default, from the in, you can go from the inbox um, and send to it, and then manually select it. But there's no email uh, to automatically link. Uh, like an email address to automatically associate an inbox item with uh, with an opportunity. So it's it's a bit more of a manual process. Okay, thank you. Um, now uh, this for locally installed Office and hosted example Swift Page Keystroke RTG. Mm -hmm. do you, do you, uh, Austin, um, I'm going to take over from here because there's a couple of commercial details that I want to go yep. through with people. Can you uh, give me the screen back? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, show my screen. Okay, so let's go to our website. Because there is quite a bit of additional potential with um, with this product versus the Act for Outlook. So the Act for Outlook, um, which we've sold thousands of, of copies, um, very, very powerful, but it, because it's written with the SDK, it is limited to 32-bit versions of Office. Um, what we've obviously learned over the last year is that Microsoft has shifted from having a default installation of 32-bit to a default installation of 64-bit. So even if you're downloading and installing, it's not even gonna prompt you um, to select which bit version uh, you've got it's going to install 64-bit, um, you know, unless you go to the trouble of telling it otherwise. So you know, this this is important to understand because um, unlike previous versions, because we're working with the web API, we can actually support the 64-bit version of Office. Now it won't work. You won't be able to attach it to the local database, but when you think about it, it doesn't matter. Even if you have a local copy of of Act and a local install of um, of Outlook, and let's say your Outlook is 64-bit, you have the ability to write histories directly to the web database. Okay, even if you're not using it, it will automatically write to the web database, and then your local database will get uh, those updates and those history notes um, when it syncs. 
But this bridges the gap that previously we weren't able to do before because of the SDK limitations um, to allow us to uh, have a local RDB, okay, but write um, history with local 64-bit version of Office directly to a hosted database. So that that's rather um, big in terms of um, of flexibility because you know we didn't have any good news for anyone that was asking us for this. Okay, because we we can't obviously program outside the limits of the uh, the SDK. So you can see I just typed in here. I went to shop, typed in here. We've got Act for a Look Web. Okay. Now one of the things I want to quickly go through here is that you can see that you've got trial versions of 32-bit and 64-bit. So they are separate installers. So please note that if you've got a customer that's interested in one or the other, that they are to download um, the one that's appropriate to their uh, their office. Okay. Second thing is you're going to notice the price. It's $24. Now normally it's it's uh, $36 and change. Um, now it is uh, $24 per year. You're going to notice that this is a subscription now. Okay, um, it's still based on on activation. Okay, but you can see that the platform is Act for Web. There's no prerequisites. Okay, um, but using the API, guess what? You need an Act subscription. Okay, so again, uh, no perps, no pros. Um, has to use an Act subscription. Okay, what we've done is we've listed that the start date for available uh, for sale on this will be Sunday. Uh, it's just a little glitch. If I don't put Sunday, then it will not make it available on Monday morning. So this will become available sometime on Sunday and um, you know it's commercial, it's going to market on Monday morning, okay? Um, here's where you can go through the different information. Now, one of the things that I wanna stress because we often get uh, questions about, you know, how do I do this? Where's the setup instructions? I wanna show, make sure that everyone is uh, aware Okay, act for com, put in the KB, of course. Everyone is aware of the KB here, okay? So you go to uh, kb.actforwork.com and you type in act for outlook, okay? And you get all of these articles relating to act for outlook. And then you say how to set up act for outlook web and you've got detailed instructions here. So if you feel that you weren't able to keep up with this demo because we had to go through uh, fairly quickly because we're covering a lot of products, um, you've got all detailed instructions here. Okay, and this was just recently uh, published. Okay, so again, um, you can do how do I set up out for Outlook, uh, notifier, all of these other things here. So, you know, you've got the ability to have or, or resource uh, quite a bit of documentation on this site. Obviously, it's difficult to send out manuals uh, for these kinds of products, but, you know, we constantly update uh, this knowledge base uh, as often as we can. Okay, so I've covered the business, um, I've covered the on-premise versus the web, uh, the cost and the KB resources, and those were the the final issues that I wanted to wrap up. Um, you know, like always, these are reseller protected, so you can buy these on margin um, and resell the subscriptions to your customers. Now, one one more question is, I'm confused on the API versus SDK for Act for Outlook, what is the back end on it now? Right now it's the SDK. Mean, oh, go okay, ahead. so the Act for, Act for Outlook is written in the SDK. That's why it can only support 32-bit uh, versions of Office. Okay, so it's, it's meant to work with local copies of Act and local copies of Outlook. Um, the Act for Outlook web, all the database settings as um, as Austin demonstrated, all the database settings point to the web API um, location and the web API uh, database. So the the history is being written there. And because of that, okay, we're able to support 64-bit versions of Office because we're not using the SDK. Okay. So, okay, so that, that should cover it. If you're asking what language is written in, no, no, uh, no, Austin pri primarily does uh, C sharp. No, that's covered. Uh, any restrictions for Swift page? I assume or for the uh, the cloud. No, there's there's absolutely none. You just need an active subscription because we're using the web API. They don't need to do anything on their end. Um, you know, same thing with Book to Act. You don't need anything installed, any DLLs, them to turn on anything. If you have a um, 
an Act Premium Cloud or an Act subscription using Act Connect in good standing, then this will work. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Ken and Awesome. Uh, that's it for the questions. So we will make this available for um, the recording for people. So uh, please email me or I will also post and send an email out to all of you with the link once we get it up. So thank you very much. And that's it. Thanks for attending. Have a good day.